I'm Joellen McCarthy, and I'm a lifelong learner and educator who believes in the power of read-alouds. I'm also the proud author of Layers of Learning, where I share my thinking around the ways we can use picture books to connect literacy and caring conversations. Together, let's connect our students to the stories, the people, and the possibilities for learning on and off the pages of their books. Welcome everyone. I'm super excited to be back for another episode of Behind the Book where the audience can learn about mentor authors and mentor illustrators and see the wonderful gifts that they have given us in the books that we can bring into our classroom. And with this Behind the Book series, we have the opportunity to bring authors into the room so kids can really learn directly from these amazing mentor authors. And today I am privileged and honored to have Hoshanda from Hoshanda Sanders, the author of I Can Write the World. And this book, this beautiful book was also illustrated by Charlie Palmer. And for those of you who don't know about the book, I'm so excited to um, let our guest author feature a little book talk for us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Joellen. Uh, I Can Write the World is the story of eight-year-old Ava Murray, who um, is from the Bronx and uh, like her mother is, Kim, and she sees uh, different aspects of the borough in a way that's uncommon. Most people don't know very much about the Bronx except for the negative. Um, and she sees some negative elements in her environment too, um, but it causes her to ask more questions about the perspective from which people see those events um, and um, eventually prompts her to become a journalist. And so um, she, or to want to become a journalist. And so she um, begins to ask her mother about the history of the borough and the perspectives that they usually see on the news and how that differs from what she sees and lives every day in the Bronx. Uh, which is sort of narrated both in text um, and also through the beautiful illustrations of Charlie Palmer. I love that you have, uh, you know, a gorgeous um, author's note and Charlie Palmer also put an illustrator's note in the book. And I think those things are really essential when we have books that, you know, if we don't have the opportunity to engage in conversations directly with the talented authors and illustrators, that we have some aspect to get insight into the story. Were you able to collaborate with him? I know sometimes authors and illustrators do get to collaborate, but not always. That's a great question. So actually, um, Charlie Palmer, uh, at the time when he was making the book, lived in Atlanta. Um, and uh, I think he's still based there. And, you know, he's a fine artist. Um, and works, you know, on multiple different projects and that kind of thing. Like many illustrators and artists, he's very busy. But he actually came up to the Bronx um, to uh, see kind of the neighborhood that I was writing about, which happens to also be the neighborhood in which I live. And um, it was like blazing hot and uh, middle of summer. And but, you know, he was game to kind of walk the stretch um, of Bruckner Boulevard, essentially, which is um, further down Bruckner, quite a ways from me, actually, about a mile or so, um, is the Zyro's Bakery that, you know, is featured uh, in the book. And, um, you know, he included the train station that's on the cover, which is my train station, um, which was lovely. Uh, and, you know, so like, yeah, all those little details, you know, there's the, you see on the cover, the construction with the crane, you know, there's been lots of construction in my neighborhood. So he really captured, um, I think, a lot of that world and that experience um, really beautifully. You mentioned uh, in your description, one of my favorite parts of the book, when Ava's mom talks to her about sharing her talents with the world. And if it's okay, I can just share this one page because I think it speaks to what you just talked about. This is like my favorite page because she says, you know, creativity is using what you have to make a map of your dreams, what you see in your mind or what you feel in your heart. And it can come out and dance colors or beats. And I just think this is so beautiful. Of course, your words are gorgeous and the illustration 
illustrations are equally beautiful to demonstrate all of that. It's just such an amazing book. And I think it couldn't be more timely with, you know, just celebrating the importance that every one of us can use our unique voice and talents. And to also have a role model, as you said, you know, as a, a woman of color writing this book about a young woman of color and the aspirations and the dreams that she has. And I think also, if you want to touch a little bit more on that perspective point, because I think that's so huge um, for all of our kids to be discussing and to be looking at and to be thinking about the bias in media, in news, in the world, in graphics and illustrations and stories. So maybe you can speak a little bit more about that and some aspects of the story, um, because I love this. And that's so great to hear. Thank you so much. Um, so in the story, Ava, um, you know, she is eight years old and, um, you know, eight-year-olds are really perceptive, maybe more perceptive than we give them credit for. Um, and as adults, I think our inclination is to protect them um, and to shield them from some of the negative aspects of their environment. In a place like the Bronx or New York City, it's a little bit more difficult to do that, though, right? Because there are so many people and there's such density. And so uh, I remember being young and seeing different things in my environment the way that Ava does. She encounters a young girl about her age or not much older than her who gets arrested for doing graffiti. And this is what prompts her to begin to ask her mother questions about, um, you know, she thinks that the graffiti that she sees in her neighborhood is really beautiful. Um, but obviously this girl has gotten in trouble for doing something similar. And so it points out to that contradiction that children often experience, right? Where they, they see one thing uh, as being positive, but then someone who looks like them gets in trouble. And so it's like, well, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? You know, it can be really confusing. And so the way that her mother explains it to her is by, um, sharing something that actually I didn't realize this at the time, but um, Rudine Sims Bishop has a metaphor about windows and doors. And so it's sort of like that. Um, she explains, she tells um, Ava to look at the window. And if you look at the frame around the window, it shapes everything that you see when you look out of the window. And that's the function of journalists. Right. <laughs> that's that the page right, right there, right. Yeah, they're shaping the world around them based on their perspective. And so that to her is a revelation because she's like, huh, yeah, that's true. Like, depending on how you look at it, you might see some things, you know, in a different way than someone who's looking at a different window might look or, you know, that really does shape the the way that I see things. And so she says to her mom, I think I want to do that. Uh, Ava Murray is uh, named for Ava DuVernay, the filmmaker and creator, um, because of all of her uh, wonderful contributions to film. Um, and um, I think just also educating people on things like mass incarceration um, and other untold stories um, that are, are typically um, not narrated with as much care. And uh, the Reverend Dr. Pauli Murray, um, who uh, I think if if Pauli Murray were alive in this time, she probably would have identified as trans, um, which is sort of complicated, um, right? But during during her lifetime, she was not able to um, identify um, sort of as a gender non-conforming person. Um, so I often just use Pauli's name, but um, Pauli uh, was a um, pioneer of the legislation Jane Crow. Um, and kind of a, uh, um, I want to say, a trailblazer for what we now think of as intersectionality, which is looking at the framework, the many um, different fault lines um, and intersections of identity that can create bias um, or layers of bias um, with regard to gender, race, class, um, but usually gender and race. And so, um, she actually was, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually credited Polly Murray with um, her early sort of complex understanding of feminism and all of the different people who were impacted in feminisms. And so um, Ava Murray is named for both of those dynamic people. And um, she 
learns to also have a different perspective on hip hop culture uh, in the book, which is not necessarily, uh, most people when they hear hip hop, if they're not familiar with the Bronx or with hip hop writ large outside of kind of stereotypes, um, they only think of hip hop as being music, but hip hop is also graffiti and it's also dance. And it's also about um, sort of a fusion of uh, cultures that um, represent the Black diaspora, not just Africa and uh, the States, but also, you know, the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, you know, those other cultures. So um, it's a lot kind of in in the book that's not as explicitly stated, um, but that's sort of the the general, I think, thrust. Can you tell our audience a little bit about how we have more to expect from Ava Murray? Because I'm thrilled to share that Six Foot Press has um, committed to more books in the series and maybe we get to hear a little glimpse of that. Yeah, absolutely. So A Place of Our Own is scheduled to come out in April 2021. Um, you know, because of uh, the world events that we're all experiencing um, that may change, but I hopefully not. Hopefully it will be April 2021. Um, and A Place of Our Own um, finds Ava furthering her journalistic skills. She and her friend Marisol um, are looking for a safe, place to play and to jump double dutch and it's often hot on the sidewalk and crowded in front of her building um so she wants there to be a park where she can play a nice green safe space and um there's one that's proposed in her neighborhood uh but she goes one step further and she writes an op-ed that helps kind of push the push the efforts along so um you know, it's to be determined whether or not that actually happens, but um, she's becoming essentially a citizen journalist um, and using her voice even more in the second book. That's wonderful to hear. And I can't wait for that one because, again, I'm envisioning, you know, the opportunity to then extend the conversations and the work with kids, how they can view things that are going on in their own lives, in the world, in their communities, and really do something about it. So that's a wonderful gift, another gift that we have to look forward to. Thank you, um, thank you for that. I also, yeah, I just want to follow up on what you're saying about um, young people using their voices. I think particularly for young girls and for girls of color in particular, um, there isn't, there hasn't been in my lifetime or from my experience, a lot of um, early discussions with them about kind of owning their voices and um, having the power to really shape their stories. Um, Often, I think especially in places like the Bronx, there is this um, sort of understanding that um, you are, I wouldn't say necessarily a victim of your circumstances, but essentially that um, you're kind of powerless to change the sort of trajectory of your life. And so what I, what I love so much about Ava and her mom is that they really do um, reinforce this idea that um, you can start as young as eight or seven or, you know, before then to, um, to start to tell your story and that it actually does make quite a difference, you know, in, in how people not just perceive you, but also perceive your world and perceive the people around you. And that's, that's a lot of power and it's really important. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? Because we really appreciate the fact, um, I know myself and everyone at Stenhouse appreciates the fact that we can provide this opportunity for students and teachers to hear directly from you. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for, um, for reaching out to me, for interviewing me, for spending time with the book, for exposing other people to the book. Um, you know, it's a, a writer's, um, I guess, well, I'll speak for myself. It's this writer's, you know, best aspiration, biggest dream, hope that 
when I write something that it will resonate and connect with readers. Um, and so I very much appreciate, you know, all the teachers, all of the students, all of the, the writers in process who um, have found the book and have found the book to be inspirational and um, really identify with Ava. And one of the things that keeps me going and continuing to write is knowing, um, seeing the reaction and hearing um, the, the insights and feedback that people have as it relates to Ava Murray and I Can Write for the World. So um, I, I'm really humbled and, and deeply appreciative of all the, the support. Well, I can't thank you enough. And just even, you know, that phrase itself to resonate with with our viewers and with our students, um, you know, I can write the world. I think that's just so powerful and so beautiful. And I thank you for this gift. And I look forward to um, reading more about Ava Murray and learning more from you. So thank you for your time and your talents and for all of this wonderful work. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Literacy snapshots demonstrate the ways we can extend these conversations. Here, a fifth grade student celebrates the qualities she admires most about the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Encourage your learners to think about positive role models in stories and in life, to reflect on those inspiring individuals and begin to access that promise within their own lives. When we use powerful picture books as co-teachers, we can blur the lines between lessons in reading, writing, and life. We can write and write and write, but if we're not giving the same access and, and, and opportunities and making sure they're in the classrooms, like it seems like there's a certain number of books that everyone feels like they have to have, but even those can be critically looked at.